You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow a side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews. So let's get started. Hey, hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today, I am happy to welcome into the guest chair, the woman who is putting black love on display for people to see on television screens across the country. Her name is Cody Elaine Oliver, and she is the filmmaker and creator of the Black Love documentary series on Oprah Winfrey's own network. If you've ever wondered how producers, screenwriters, and filmmakers of color get their work in front of a mass audience and on major networks and into movie studios, this is the episode for you. Cody is a graduate of Howard University and the Peter Stark Producing Program at USC. Before becoming an independent filmmaker, she worked in feature film development at Fox Searchlight Pictures, then produced events and supported filmmaking programs at Film Independent, the Los Angeles Film Festival, and the Independent Spirit Awards. On this episode, we get into her journey from Howard to independent filmmaker, how she recruited some of Hollywood's biggest names to participate in Black Love, the road to pitching own network, and how to make money as a filmmaker in Hollywood. Let's jump right into it. So welcome to the guest chair, Cody. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to chat with you. Um, I love Black Love and what you are building alongside your husband. And I just really want to know how your life experiences influence your career path. So tell us a little about that. I studied broadcast journalism at Howard, and then I worked at a 24-hour news network, which was Fox News. And I worked there for two years, and I hated it. Um, I never thought that I would like it, but I always wanted to work in entertainment journalism. And everyone said, you need to get a foundation in hard news first. And so I worked at Fox News for two years. And what I hated was really just hearing about the worst things that happen around the world every day. Um, I get that that's a part of life and it's important to be informed, but I had a hard time with it. And around that time, I, I fell in love with, um, movies and not just movies, but movie trailers. I would get really, really excited and inspired whenever I saw like a three minute movie trailer. And I started deciding to, I decided to research, um, what was required to make movies. Like what are the different roles? And I think everybody knows about directing and writing, but I, wanted to learn about producing. Once I realized that that was a thing, I wanted to learn about producing, which was the business of film. I started looking into grad programs and I found one at USC that was a producing program with a little bit of directing and a little bit of writing. And fast forward to moving to LA and going to USC, which was really my introduction to the industry. I ultimately um, was able to use both my journalism degree and my film degree to make black love. But of course there were lots of uh, highs and lows and bumps um, on the journey to that. I can imagine. So after film school, did you start working for one of the production houses or what do they call them? (laughs) Um, So uh, while I was in film school, I was interning at Fox Searchlight Pictures, which um, was one of the smaller production companies or rather they made smaller movies. And I was working with an amazing executive named Zola Mashariki. And at the time, the movie that I probably spent the most time on was Just Right. But those are the kind of movies that Zola was making at Fox Searchlight. But um, Just Right and um, Notorious, which was about Notorious B.I.G., The Secret Life of Bees, I think we made right when I was joining the company. So I interned there and ultimately worked there up to about a year after I graduated. And there was just no movement at the company. So I went over to work for Film Independent, which is a nonprofit arts organization that produces the Spirit Awards, which is basically the Oscars of independent film for those who are unfamiliar with the Spirit Awards. And they also produce the Los Angeles Film Festival. And so I went to Film Independent specifically to work for Rebecca Yeldon, who was a full-time film producer who had just started running the Los Angeles Film Festival. So um, it was an opportunity to work closely with with a producer. But being at a nonprofit arts organization that's small, that does some huge events, you do everything. 
And so I spent pretty much four years there producing events and helping to bring to life both the LA Film Fest and the Spirit Awards. So when did you know you were ready to go out on your own as a full-time producer? Was that way after you graduated from film school or right away? I went to film school to make movies. Um, I knew I wanted to produce content, even TV, but movies were the was the priority for me at the time. I knew I wanted to produce content. I knew it was important to me to tell women's stories and specifically tell universal stories through Black people. Uh, it was important to me to see more of us on screen, and it didn't have to be an urban film or something specific to Black people, but the reality is that there, we on this planet are very similar. We do a lot of the same things and it's okay to tell a rom-com um, or some other type of drama with black characters. And so it was important to me to do those things. And when I went to film school, you, you go in and you're like, yay, I'm going to go to school and then I'm going to make movies. And it's not that easy. So when did I know that I was going to do that right away? But I certainly had to learn a lot about the path. And there are people who, I guess, come right out of film school or come right to L.A. and and get the right job or or create the right content. But for me, it was much more of a journey, um, a journey both in really just creating and developing and and starting things and learning that they're not as good as I think they are. And I have to keep working (laughs) on them. Um, I mean, really, I, I think that a lot of any profession where you're sort of doing your own thing, you're not working for a company, but it's, it's a learning process of figuring out what's good and what's not. And it doesn't mean it doesn't deserve to be better and you have to scrap it. It just means you got to work on it. So there were highs and lows for sure of thinking like, now's my time. When I was at Fox Searchlight, I was like, I'm going to work here forever. I love this company. I love the movies they're making. Nobody was going anywhere. So I could have been an assistant forever. You know, when I worked for my boss at the uh, Los Angeles Film Festival, I thought, I love her. I'm going to work for her and I'm going to work on her movies. And it just wasn't that simple. The budget of the films didn't allow for me to sort of transition out of film independent to working on these films. And so it's just, you know, these these various things. And the reality is I was probably very afraid to do it to myself. This industry is such that... Um, yes, you can get the right job or work for the right person and parlay that into a career, but you can also just create content and, and allow your voice to be heard. And at some point, somebody will give you the money that you need to make the next thing, or somebody will buy your idea, et cetera, et cetera. But even that is just not as simple as it sounds. And it requires a lot of bravery that I've seen from many of my friends out here. Um, and uh, and so for me, I, I know I was afraid to like go it alone. I was afraid, you know, you, you barely make any money in these jobs. I just want to be really clear that um, these production companies, studios, even you're barely making any money. So the idea of making none <laughs> to develop and pound the pavement on an, on an idea of your own is very scary. And I, I know for me, it was tough. It was tough to make that decision. And so I had this idea for Black Love, just as this is one of the projects that I had worked on over the last 10 years of me being in L.A. But I had this idea for Black Love, honestly, in 2007, 2008. Wow. So taking it back, that's 10 years ago, right? What happened between then and now? Like, were you working odd jobs on the side to bring these projects to fruition? The reality was I was working full time on the side. (laughs) You know, I was working full time thinking that I could develop my ideas and get them to a place where like I can then go out with them and and get the money that I need or, you know, that that right moment would show itself. And not that I would say to someone, hey, you can't do you can't pursue your dreams on the side. No. But at some point you do have to give it your all right. At some point that line is different for everyone. So the reality was I was working full time and I probably wasn't giving my dreams enough attention, enough development, enough care. And so, but I don't have any regrets, you know, at all. I think it it all happened in the way it was supposed to. So when I had the idea for Black Love, it was that I knew I wanted to create a place where Black love stories lived. 
And right away, I did go and interview couples by myself. Like my, my cousin came with me. Um, she actually knew a bunch of like older married couples in Chicago where she's from. And so we did some interviews. I was going to say, how did you recruit these couples, especially like the celebrities, the big names? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a fast forward several years. So okay. the the ideation part was I did go and do some interviews and just see like, is this a real thing? Are these people going to have conversations with me? Are they going to get behind the idea? And I, and I got some great, um, I got some great couples. This is again, almost 10 years ago. I got some great couples to tell me their stories. And I, with the idea of me putting together a coffee table book. So again, all me by myself. So it was very slow, right. While working full time. So fast forward to 2013, I met my husband, Tommy, um, while working a job that, um, nothing about it felt right. And I, and I'm saying that because I really want to, um, I really hope that I can share with your audience that everything happens for a reason. Um, and so I was working a job, um, that, like I said, just didn't feel quite right for me and for my life. Um, but it was what I thought I needed in the moment in terms of like how much money I could make. Right. And, um, I met my husband, my now husband, um, at the Toronto Film Festival, and we clicked right away. That's a longer story. I always say now, I'm never telling the story of how we met again. People can just read it. <laughs> oh, that's not fair. Well, you I have to... told it. I told it in Ebony Magazine. It is there, word for word. It's very embarrassing. We'll go back if you force me to. Okay. <laughs> um, so we met there and we talked about, we clicked pretty much right away. And so we talked about black love very early on. I mean, my husband was a full-time filmmaker at that time. And I told him about this idea that I had and he was like, oh, cool. Let's do it. Like tomorrow. Let's do it. Cause that's just like the kind of person and filmmaker that he is. And, um, and I, and so just a little background, I was doing PR for Canon, the camera company, and I was working with great people, but it just wasn't, um, obviously it wasn't film. Right. So when Tommy was very supportive of the idea, we went to Canon and we asked them if they would loan us equipment and they said, yes. So now we're talking about me meeting my husband and my filmmaking partner and getting equipment from this job that like, <laughs> for other reasons was, was otherwise wrong for me. Um, and so I really just like want to emphasize how everything kind of worked out in that way. Um, and so we started shooting couples pretty much right away. We were doing other projects too, but we started shooting couples. Now the question of how do we get these people? So they were friends, they were parents of friends, they were grandparents of friends, as far as celebrities, you know, we knew a few people here and there and with everybody, whether it was a friend or an acquaintance, everybody enjoyed the interview. And then they were like, oh, you should call this person. <laughs> um, so it was it was th that simple in a way, but obviously several years in the making. Um, I had a very clear vision about what I wanted this to be and most importantly, what it could be for our community. And all of those couples believed in that. Um, I always try to give them a lot of credit because every couple that you saw in season one had, there was no own. It was just Tommy and Cody, two black, young, married people um, trying to A, learn about marriage from people who had been doing it and B, uh, show black people in a different way than the entertainment and media portrays us today. Um, and all of those couples believed in that and saw um, value in that. And so I try to give them a lot of credit for that uh, because they didn't know where this thing was going to go. I've heard you say that I think your husband ran up on Viola Davis's uh, husband in a parking lot. Is that <laughs> So, yeah, so Tommy met Viola and Julius in a parking lot yes. a year before he ever, ever asked them about the interview. Um, he met them. I think they were coming from the same event. I'm not really sure about that part, but they were in a parking lot. And Tommy was like, hi, I'm down now. <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, I, I love your work. I uh, just want to say hello. And they struck up a conversation. Um, and it wasn't until a year later that, uh, he called Julius or emailed and said, Hey, we're doing this project. Would you guys, um, be a part of it? And they said, yes. And it was still another five months before we could get on the same schedule. Um, and I try to emphasize that too, because it's a testament to, um, to, to 
everything not happening the exact moment that you want it to happen, you know, but things falling into place the way that they should and also being patient with people. Um, the thing about that, that garage meeting is that he didn't follow up with a, with a, Hey, let's have coffee or like trying to be friends with them, even though, you know, there's value in that, but it was, I'm not going to contact them until I actually have something to say. And that's really important because what that, that, what that is, is networking, you know? And I think a lot of people misuse networking or misunderstand networking, um, and don't always, uh, utilize those relationships when they should. Right. And, I, and I say that, you know, I, I have done it myself. Um, and so it's just a matter of, you know, making a good connection, keeping that contact information. And when you really have something to say, uh, reaching out. You know, your story is really a testament to the patience you need to have when you're bringing something great to fruition. How did you get over that mental barrier of knowing that you have a great idea, but knowing that it won't make money for a while? First and foremost, I knew that I had to tell this story. It really wasn't about whether it would make money. Um, I knew that uh, when the when there was this media narrative of a black marriage crisis and even saying that black women were undesirable, black women are the most alone, the more education a black woman has, the less likely she is to find someone, black men are in prison or married to white women, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, all of this was in headlines. There was even a book called Is Marriage for White People? Um, when I saw all of that, and I know how it made me feel, um, and, and my friends at the time, I just knew that we had to show something else. Like, we could talk about the data. We could answer the question, is marriage for white people? We could say, well, actually, you know, black men are married. You know, 80% of black men are married to black women, et cetera. We could do all of that. But if people don't see those positive examples of people who look like them in relationships, then you still feel like it's just numbers. It's just words. And so I just knew I had to tell this story. I owed it to myself, my friends, my community, um, to show all of us, uh, in happy, loving relationships. Um, and so that, that's really what it came down to. All righty. And you talk about, you know, the process of interviewing these couples. So you went beyond above and beyond just filming a pilot. Wasn't that? Well, we know mm -hmm. that was a huge risk, right? You didn't know if you were going to make money, but you kept doing all of these episodes. What was, was did you have a goal in mind, like a package you wanted to put together to pitch as a series? So actually, when we started the project, it was to be a documentary. Um, and so there wasn't a goal in mind in terms of like, we need this number of couples. It was, we started doing interviews, um, and we knew there were certain types of stories we wanted to tell. Like when we first started, we just took what we could get and don't get me wrong. It, in no way did that, did, did the interviews suffer as a result of that. It wasn't like we took what we can get and some of them were terrible. No, 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 no. It was like, you like this couple, you say they're going to make it, then we're going to sit down and interview them. We didn't know what we were, what, what to expect from couple to couple. And we would end up with these stories that's like, oh, this person, these people are black, but one of them's family is Jamaican. And so they are dealing with cultural differences. Oh, these people were both divorced, you know, and remarried. And, and so they're dealing with baggage and, you know, everybody was dealing with something different. And it was like, oh, wow, we need to keep making sure we get this and we have to make sure we get that. And we have to you know, and so we didn't have a goal number of couples, but we knew we wanted to have a mix of um, everyday people and celebrities. And we knew we had to have enough couples to put together a sizzle so that we could get people's attention. And so it was just one of those things where we just kept doing it to make sure we had everything that we needed. And we looked up two years later um, and we had so much content, so much strong impactful content that we realized that it needed to be a series. We couldn't do our audience justice. We couldn't do the couples justice. If we couldn't tell these stories in some ways from beginning to end. Um, and, and so that's when we decided to make it a series. And so we had all, at that point over 50 interviews, we edited episode one and we uh, did a treatment for the other three episodes, very detailed, what it would look like, what, it, what, it, what they'd be saying. And that is how we went out um, and ultimately sold the show. 
Now walk us through that process a little bit. And I know this is especially going to be useful for those interested in following your footsteps. How do you pitch a network and how do you fund that process? How do you go about that process? Did you have an agent at the time? So Tommy um, is rep at CAA. And so for us, I would say that part was fairly easy. Um, we no, we made sure that the package was as strong as possible, that there were no questions left unanswered. We were very detailed in terms of what does this show look like? Who is it for? Um, what does it feel like? And, and even to the point of uh, having the full first episode done. So you know exactly what this format is. Um, but, but CAA did send it out to various networks. Um, so we had a, a leg up in that way because there wasn't like, we're trying to knock down doors. Oh, okay. And um, how did he, how do you get mm-hmm. an agent? Like he, is that because sure. he had a couple of well, projects? Sure. Uh, uh, regarding having, well, let me just go back for a second. So to anyone that doesn't have an agent that's trying to um, put a package together for a film or television show, show, I mean, I would say have as tight a package as possible, period. Like, don't ever think such and such is enough. Oh, the treatment is enough. The script is enough. Figure out those attachments um, necessary to make your vision and your project as strong and clear as possible. Um, and then use your network and your resources to figure out how to get into those doors without an agent or manager. It is a lot harder. Don't get me wrong. Um, but just be smart about how you get in those doors because some people will hear you out, but you gotta, honestly, it, it is about who, you know, it is about networking. It is about, I got that card last year. Now my package is tight. Let me call that person. Um, so I do want to say that, but as far as how do you get a manager, an agent? Um, so Tommy was a writer, director, producer when I met him. Um, and he, we actually met at the Toronto film festival when he was premiering the first film he directed, which was, um, called 1982. And that was when he got an agent. Um, typically producers, especially up and coming producers don't have agents. It's, um, writer, directors, uh, it's a more clear path to the agency or management, um, as a writer director. And so CAA saw his film, um, right before Toronto, I think. And, and they signed him at that time. So that's how he got representation. Got it. And at what point in this process did you leave that job at Canon and, and, and <laughs> go full force towards this yeah. goal? So about a year after I met Tommy, I, uh, we decided that I would quit my job so that I could focus pretty much full time on Black Love Doc, which it is and was my baby. Um, but the reason that I was able to do that, as I mentioned, I was very fearful. Uh, I was afraid to, to take that leap. Like I mentioned, you're barely making money. And now I know that I have to quit working for others' dreams so that I can work on my own. And it's scary. And I, I don't know that I would have done it or I don't know when I would have done it without a partner, to be quite honest, without um, my fiance at the time, you know, for lack of a better description, splitting the bills. Like that's a real thing. And I don't want to sugarcoat for anyone who's like trying to decide if they're going to make that leap, that it's easy, you know? Um, so for me, having that push and that partner made it a lot easier. But when I quit my job, Tommy was about to produce a film in um, Detroit. And so, you know, obviously with my background working in film development, that was that was definitely a perfect time for me to quit my job and work on this film. And so we produced a film called Destined, uh, starring Corey Hardrick, who is also in Black Love. We produced a film called Destined in Detroit uh, in 2014, and that's when I quit my job. Um, and that's sort of an important point in our, in, in this journey, because it was a way for me to still have some income. Obviously Tommy's still being supportive. He's just come off a big film. He produced, uh, the perfect guy with Sanaa Lathan and Michael Ely and, um, Morris Chestnut. And so it was a good time to do that and to put our personal resources and energy into black love and other projects. So that was when I quit my job. Hey guys, Michaela here with a quick word from our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is one of my major side hustle hacks. It's an online learning community with over 17,000 classes and everything from business analytics to copywriting to photography, all taught by expert practitioners. 
I use Skillshare to stay up to date on everything from the latest in social media strategy to email marketing techniques. Right now, I'm really focused on email marketing because I may be a writer by nature, but copywriting is a whole different beast. I know I'm not the expert, so I'm learning from the pros on Skillshare. The best part about Skillshare is that you never have to pay per class again because membership includes unlimited access to their entire class catalog for one low monthly price. I have about 10 courses bookmarked to check out as we speak. Skillshare is now offering Side Hustle Pro listeners one free month of unlimited learning. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash Hustle Pro. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash Hustle Pro to claim your free month. going to ask a real basic basic question but Mm -hmm. when you say produce right Mm -hmm. I've always thought of that as or or learned that as the the money people right not only are you organizing Mm -hmm. it but you're funding so if you are a up-and-coming filmmaker what does a producer actually do okay so (laughs) (laughs) so so producing for film and for television is different producing for film I would summarize it as saying producing is the business of film. That does not mean that you're not creative. I would say that some film producers are solely money people and some are creative and business, meaning strategic when I say business in that way. And so the producer's job honestly is to see the film from start to finish. And what's funny about this crazy business is that even that everything is, is, is gray and negotiable, right? So there are still some producers that may come in after production, but for the most part the, the, the way that I think of a producer and the traditional way producing works is just the person that is driving the vision of the film from start to finish. The director, let's say in, in our case, Justin was a writer director. So the director has the vision of the story and the producer helps to develop that, to, to work with them, to make it as strong as possible and to find the, to help find the money. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the producer is putting in their own, which some producers do. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's one of those things that can be a little gray and it can mean many things, but on the most basic level, you're making sure that that film happens. And that means if you're, if you're making a $5 million movie and you only have $4 million, while it is um, everyone's job to, to, to do their best and to get that film uh, across the finish line, the producer is the one who's sweating looking for that million dollars. <laughs> Got it. Whew, I'm glad I asked that. Okay. Now <laughs> back to pitching own. Did you have a vision of where it would make sense for black love to live? We actually went to several networks. Um, but I would say from the beginning 2007, it was always owned for me. I'm not even sure they know that, but <laughs> But OWN was pretty new back then, but with what Oprah stands for, and even with the content that has come and gone from that network, because it's obviously evolved into many things, I just knew that that was the best possible home for it. What I love about OWN um, is that it's, you know, synonymous with Oprah and her brand, and her brand is um, love, love of self, love of each other, and... um, and putting good out into the world. And so I, Black Love is all of that to me, the show and, and all of its iterations that we are working on, including the, the social media platform. Um, but that's what Black Love stands for to me. And so one of the things that I loved about OWN as well is that the audience of the network isn't just Black people. While that may be a, a primary audience for them, I knew that our show could reach um all kinds of people all over our country. And that was really important. And did you have to pitch to Mama Oprah herself or (laughs) how was that process? Um, We didn't actually. We, uh, CAA, sorry, this chair makes a lot of noise. CAA sent the pitch packet, which was that first episode and the um, treatment for the other three episodes out to various networks. And to Owen's credit, they jumped on it right away and said, we want this. So there really wasn't, we never had to go in a room and and say, this is what it is. And this is why you should make it. They were like, oh, this is great. We'll take it. Um, And, and they were a great partner all the way through. And I'm sure that's also a testament to just how great of a packet you put together, because, you know, what I don't want people to take away from this is go out there, film a bunch of episodes about, you know, whatever project you're working on, 
Mm -hmm. um, and just pitch it. And if you have it all, if you have a pilot, like I know no one thinks it's easy, but at the same time, I don't want you to gloss over how much thought you put into this presentation of your work. Right. Um, You're absolutely right. I mean, I would say you'd be surprised. Some people think it is very easy. And the reality is that um, you just have to be thorough. The bar is so high for great content. And then add to that relatively unknown storytellers. You know, we have it harder. If if we went in there and we thought about this, um, attaching a producer early on, that was a name. And I don't mean, you know, (laughs) <laughs> that word producer again. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so uh, that's just to give you a little more context. So some producers, as I mentioned, may come on at the end or some producers come on at the beginning and do nothing but add their name and their name has value. So I don't want to take anything away from that, but um, we could have attached a celebrity friend or something to put their name on it as a producer and, and say, Hey, this is, um, I I don't want to drop any right now, but, um, you know, if we'd had that package, then that opens doors even more so. Right. And people go, Oh, well, this person's attached. So it's probably good. Or, you know, we'll hear them out or whatever. We didn't do that. It was just Cody and Tommy, pretty, pretty uh, random, uh, up and coming filmmakers. And so they really had to evaluate it for the content. And to that end, the content has to be strong. And when I say that, too, about pretty random filmmakers, Tommy had produced The Perfect Guy. I mean, that movie broke records when it came out. Um, it was a, And it was a, a very wi- well-received film. You know, he had done a film that premiered at Toronto. He had premiered, uh, produced a film that premiered at Sundance. Um, I had worked at various production companies. Um, but we're that, all of that, and we still had to have a really, really strong package so that we would be taken seriously and so that there were no questions about what it could be. How does one make money as a producer, as a filmmaker? What are some of the revenue streams or the ways that you can package your your deals to ensure continuous income? So the, the cool thing about our business is that everything's negotiable. And and really in this in this day and age, there's there are so many revenue streams, right? Um, so with a with a TV show or even a film, you know, you make money. Well, both are different, but you can make money by selling your project outright. You can make money by licensing your project to a network or studio. And then there are other revenue streams like digital. You know, there's Amazon and there's even YouTube now is a big player in, in television, but there's Amazon and, and Netflix. And so there are a lot of ways that you can make sure that revenue is, I don't want to say always coming in, but will come in for a while on a project. What's valuable is is whenever you are working on a television show or film project, just make sure that when you're at the point where you're working with a network or, or um, studio, that you have a good lawyer and that you are clear on the ways in which you can make money so that you can negotiate for yourself, so that you and that lawyer can negotiate for you. Because like I said, in this business, everything is negotiable. So figure out how not to leave money on the table. Don't just accept whatever you're being offered. So, okay, you're committed to Black Love, which is your baby, but then how else are you ensuring that, you know, you have a increased project slate? How do you know how many projects that you can balance at once given this long-term commitment? So I will say I've honestly learned that I don't like to juggle a bunch of stuff. I don't like to juggle a bunch of stuff in my brain. I don't have space for it, but I would, but it's extremely important in this business to always have something else going on because you never know when something is going to, um, stall, uh, for various reasons, whether it's, you know, my writers got stuck on something else or no one seems to want to buy this right now, or that my ideal actor has just signed on to do this other thing for, you know, you never know when something's going to stall. So you always have to have things going on. Um, and you also don't know when everything's going to pick up speed at once. And, and that's a good problem to have. So for me, the number of projects uh, is, is first off, whatever really gets me excited. Like I said, with Black Love, I didn't, it wasn't ever about the money. 
I, I knew that there was money to be made, but like how much, I don't know. And so anything that I would do for free, uh, that's what I want to be doing and then figuring out how to make money off of it. Um, I always say, I want to do what makes me happy until it doesn't anymore. Um, and, and anything that's, that I'm doing just for a paycheck doesn't make me happy, you know, or, or maybe it won't only make me happy, I want to snap so long. to that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm on poetry night, like <laughs> that. Yeah, I so it, relate about, to that. Yeah. And it's about really searching for those things that, that get you excited. Um, because especially in film and TV, you're with the project for so long. Like why you never know when it's going to, like I said, stall or pick up and don't do things that you don't actually care about. Um, so yeah, for me, it's only a handful of projects. I mean, I've got, um, two, uh, book adaptations that I'm working on right now and um, season two of Black Love and and honestly season 10 of Black Love because I don't plan to ever stop shooting until I have to for some reason. Um, so it's important to me to really create a conversation around uh, healthy relationships and especially in the Black community. And so I'm always going to make that my priority Um and just continue to, to work on projects that excite me. Now, what would you say has changed in your business since you first got started on this path? I've learned to think a lot more strategically than I used to. While I mentioned like it was never about making money, I would do this project for nothing. Once I learned the various ways I could make money, it was like, oh yeah, we should do that. <laughs> And so that has changed in me is, is thinking more strategically about the various ways, A, to build revenue, B, to build our brand. I'm learning so much about social media. And I would say I love um, platforms like yours because I think it's super important to talk about the fails because everybody sees the highs. And it's like, oh, my God, look what you did. But it's like so many things go wrong. But I had some very unsuccessful relationships with um, social media managers for Black Love Doc. It taught me a lot about like what to look for and what makes good social media and what, you know, even something as simple as like working with someone in L.A. who I can see every day versus in another city, you know. And so social media has been a, a great way to build our brand Black Love and also to build our personal brands as it relates to Black Love and our other projects. I think I have been trying to tell these creative stories and I need to think outside the box sometimes on how to tell those stories. Thank you for bringing up a fail because, yeah, I do, you know, I hate when people gloss over the journey or they forget, you know, because it's been a while, they forget True. some of the, the missteps, but no, we need to know it all. Good, bad, ugly, in between. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so, speaking of that, what's been the biggest challenge or just most surprising part, other than the social media uh, person, of course, of being an entrepreneur? Well, look, this wasn't surprising, but I was, like I said, I was very anxious and very fearful of being an entrepreneur, of being self-employed, um, which is funny because my parents both were. My dad um, is a, was a doctor who had his own practice. My mom was a lawyer with her own practice. Um, and, and I knew that it, there was, that it was in me, but the idea of actually not receiving a salary and health care uh, to have to do those things on my own was very scary. So honestly, the there, there was no surprise in that um, as much as I just had to learn a lot about how to manage that you know, and how to be responsible and how to work with an accountant and, and not think that I can do everything myself. And then add to that, you know, having a partner, and I don't mean professionally, I mean, in life, my husband, that I have to, we have to get on the same page about, uh, being self-employed about how we manage our funds, um, and have those tough conversations. And so it's sort of twofold in that way. Um, being in a relationship and being an entrepreneur and, um, and also working on some things together and not everything. Um, so still, it's still a work in process or progress. It's, we're still learning how to do that. Um, 
And I, I don't see it getting really clear anytime soon, but that's okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's okay. Yeah. It's just a part of, it's a part of blending your, your lives, your personalities, the way in which you're comfortable um, and, uh, and learning what it really takes to be not just successful, but I guess responsible, you know? Right. And speaking of that, you know, responsibility and, and, you touched on something that most people are the most scared of, which is detaching themselves from that system where they have benefits right. included. And sure. it, yeah, what was that process like, especially as someone who's had a child, right? That's something that's mm. especially scary for women who are thinking of jumping out. How am I going to have a baby? I need health insurance. How did you tackle that process? So true. Um, so I quit my job a year and a half before I got pregnant, a little, a little, well, about a year and a half before I got pregnant. And, um, and I knew I was going to have a baby. I mean, like I, I knew I wanted to have a baby. I knew we were going to have a child as soon as possible. So that was never, <laughs> it was like, we're going to figure this out. But it, <laughs> it was definitely scary. It was definitely scary. And I'll be honest, the year that we were pregnant was one of the toughest years financially. Um, and, and it required a lot of, um, communication and, um, and working together to keep projects moving. Because as I mentioned, you never know when something is going to really start moving. Um, and, and so, I mean, the short answer is that it, it was just scary, but we had to press on. We knew that we had to keep shooting black love. Um, I'm trying to think that was actually toward the end of the year was when, was when own came on. So I was pregnant in 2016, which was last year. Um, and own came on probably around October, uh, when the baby was born in October and ha, huh, Okay. So as I mentioned, the year that we were pregnant was probably our most um, difficult year financially. And own came on to black love, uh, right around the time the baby was born before that, as I mentioned, we cut the first episode and a treatment for the other three. I was like seven months pregnant doing that. Uh, maybe eight working every day, um, for, for the, the expectation that this would yield results, but no guarantees, of course. And so I say all that to say it was a lot of work. It was something that I love. There's no way in hell I would have done all of that with, if it was something that I was just doing for money, you know? Um, and then when they did come on, we had to finish the show. <laughs> you know, We had to do the other three episodes. So I started working again when my son was one month and we delivered the other three episodes when he was four months. And I say all that to just reiterate, never would have happened if it was not for something that I loved and something that I knew would benefit our community. Like I was just so passionate about it. I never would have worked the first four months of my, of my son's life. And of course you think when you're self-employed, I don't have to, but I did. And the thing is, it was worth it because we edited that show in our living room. We had a, a wonderful editor who would come to my apartment every day and we edited that show in our living room with our baby. Um, and so the pros and cons of it were that we were working on the show every day, but the baby was in the next room. You know, and if you if I had to if I, if I wasn't self-employed, then I would be going to an office or something um, and leaving my son at home. So so the the good most certainly outweighed the bad. And um, and so, like I said, it was a tough year, but we knew what we were working toward. And as far as the health care of it all, I mean, every month it was like, I hope that check clears. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you had but health was, insurance. So you hard. just got it and independently. Yeah, 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 it was tough. All righty. So now we're going to transition to the lightning round. Okay. You just answer the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Sure. All right. Number one, what's a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Quick answer, my husband. Sorry, y'all. Oh, shout out to Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> that Carnegie Mellon degree has come in useful for both of us. Carry on. <laughs> Number two, what's the best business book or podcast episode that you've consumed this year? Uh, the founder of Blavity on Side Hustle Pro. Oh, snaps <laughs> to you. <laughs> Number three, who inspires you and why? Ooh, um, 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 black women, black mothers, 
um, we are just always doing amazing things. And I just love watching and learning from y'all. The end. (laughs) I hear that. Number four, what's a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Ooh, uh, compassion. Is that a habit? (laughs) Well, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about Um, that I think that just really understanding what people feel and what they need to feel good um, or rather caring about what people need. I think that that helps me be a better storyteller. I think that that helps me most certainly with my baby, Black Love. But I, I hold on to that because I think as storytellers, we've got to understand emotion and how to touch people. And finally, number five, what's your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss but are worried about losing a steady paycheck? My advice is to do what's scary. Be responsible, but do what's scary. Responsible meaning don't live on the street if that's not what you're into. But do what's scary. On that note, what's the best way that we can connect with you after this episode? There is a contact link on our Black Love Doc social media that is a direct email for us. That would be the best way. All righty. Well, Cody, thank you so much for joining us in the guest chair today. Thank you. All righty, guys. There you have it. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at Side Hustle Pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the Side Hustle Pro Facebook community. Go to sidehustlepro.co forward slash mastermind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week.